trend of removing freeways, so rather than talking about building new ones, we're talking about taking down the old ones. And a third one, which um, is looking at technological advancements in motor vehicles, and, and that being an assault. Thank you. 
incomes that are kind of uh, not growing as much and stabilized, and, and that's resulted in less uh, vehicle ownership. So this is just looking at the uh, age sex pyramid from 1990.
vehicles. So with a push from the federal government to increase fuel efficiency standards, that's one thing that's having an impact. Uh, and combined with you know, electric vehicles and hybrids and so forth. So you know, the uh, you know, number of miles per gallon that you get is increasing, which means uh, less fuel sales. And so this is one of the things that it's not really the, I don't think the academics are kind of leading this charge. This is more driven by uh, each state transport department that's kind of figured out when they look at their tax receipts that you know the numbers are declining and what this is going to mean. Um, some are blaming it on uh, the hybrids and they're looking at ways to um, get money from hybrid owners because they're suggesting they drive as much as anybody else. So um, we need to find a different way of uh, getting funds for transport improvements. Um, so another one, this is another new story on states target hybrids. Uh, Virginia worried that cars are becoming too fuel efficient. So, and the bottom line here is that the people that are worried about these are the, the state transport and then the, the, the treasury departments are the, the, that are collecting the, the revenues. Uh, so one of the suggestions is, well, we need to find a way to uh, fix the gas tax. And some states are suggesting that maybe the, the strategy there is to, uh, to raise the gas tax. So what what does this look like? So we looked at driving. So how does what is this? We look at how this has affected um, gasoline and diesel consumption. So this is you know 30 years worth of data from the Federal Highway Administration, and you can see what's happened there in terms of millions of gallons sold, where you know basically it's come up and kind of declined and leveled off. Um, diesel got a similar pattern. This is looking at um, kind of revenues and expenditures, and um, at least for the road guys, it looks like they've done a little bit better of keeping 
socialist, uh, mainly as a result of uh, uh, as a result of declining revenues. So in Toronto, where I'm currently living, there's the this giant I don't know, 12 lane freeway that goes across, around the waterfront along the waterfront of the Gardner Expressway. It's elevated. it or if you just say too bad go someplace else. Um, the most most of these are, are replaced with surface streets like the West Side um, Highway in New York City. You know they can just get rid of it. There's a there's a road that runs along that alignment. Same with the Embarcadero in San Francisco, but it's um, certainly less obtrusive. Seattle driving this idea about removing freeways, and I suggest that this is one an emerging trend that lots and lots of cities are going to be talking about. Um, I'm not sure if Atlanta's had any discussion about removing freeways or whether they're still in the construction phase, uh, but uh, there certainly are a lot of other benefits that occur from removing a freeway, and anybody that has ever visited San Francisco while the Embarcadero Freeway was there, this elevated thing that ran along waterfront, you know, created a, a definite barrier there. Now it's, you know, got streetcars, it still has car traffic, bicycles, pedestrians. It's a great outdoor uh, space. And Seattle is probably uh, anticipating a similar kind of thing with, with the removal of their freeway. But probably the best example in the, in the place that did this first, and this was not really driven by a maintenance issue, uh, is in Seoul, and this is what it looked like. You had an elevated freeway and one underneath, ran right through the, the middle of Seoul, and, um, and this is what it looks like today. Basically, there was a, there, there was a creek that ran, a stream that ran the length of this. Um, they restored that. They basically did not replace all those Else. They basically provided some bus rapid transit, some additional subway capacity. They did a lot of things. It was a very holistic approach. And the, um, the guy that the mayor of uh, Seoul at the time, this was so successful that he, um, he became president of the country based on this, this success. So I haven't visited there, but I, you know, if you get to Seoul, you definitely need to look at this to see how it's kind of transform the city, not only from an aesthetic standpoint, but from a heat island effect, real estate values, the whole, you know, it just has transformed the city. Probably similar to the, the big dig in Boston, which uh, did this on a, um, a smaller scale. Uh, although I will say that in Korea, they were able to do this in 1995 for $900 million. Uh, the big dig in Boston, about $16 billion, I think. Um, so, now, the, the last, last thing that I want to talk about in terms of uh, emerging trends, and I have to say that uh, I've always been skeptical of this, but I'm kind of I'm changing my thinking on this, uh, are basically the, the drive to make vehicles uh, self-driving or autonomous. Now, I've known for at least a decade or more that there are billions and billions of dollars being spent by technology companies, um, you know, trying to, to work this out. Um, and the one thing that's changed over the last, um, sometime in the last 10 years, is a, a change in the thinking about um, how this is going to I'll show a slide in a second that illustrates that. But, so these 
these advances are things as like a collision avoidance system, and certainly um, I think you would see it, have seen these ads from Toyota. Um, So some of these things already exist. Um, other things are coming in terms of this. You will see things B2B, which is vehicle to vehicle connectivity, and B2I, which is vehicle to infrastructure connectivity, um, all the way to leading to basically self-driving vehicles. So this was the, the view, and this idea about having driverless cars is not a new idea. This is from a popular mechanics magazine um, in, in the 30s or 40s, and you can see that, you know, kind of got bubble top Cadillacs. They look like Cadillacs with their fins. But the idea has always been that there would be some sort of guidance system in the road, some sort of, not a, some electronic kind of guidance system that would, you know, put your car there and it would just fly you down the road. So, and that's, that was kind of the case up until um, probably, you know, 10 years ago, maybe not as, um, maybe even sooner than that. And this is what's happened. So the, the whole paradigm that for having autonomous vehicles would require this big infrastructure investment by government, basically, to provide the roads with this, this capacity, it, it, they turned it on its head. So how they turned it on its head, well, now all the technology rests in the vehicle, not in the road. Nothing would have to change with existing highways for this to happen. And so this just gives you uh, an indicator of all the different kinds of things that exist, like on the, the Google um, car that's around, but also Mercedes, um, Volvo, and so forth. They're you know, combining all these technologies that are basically vehicle to vehicle connectivity and vehicle to infrastructure. And it's interesting that one of the, the folks that are kind of leading this charge is KPMG. This report um, came out two weeks ago, I think. This was done last year. Um, where they're kind of looking at a range of issues and how this might affect car manufacturing, insurance companies, and the like. But they probably uh, have done the most in this of looking at some of the non-technological aspects of, uh, of this trend. The, this came from their report where they're looking at kind of measuring uh, Twitter feeds on, on the topic. These are the blue is total, and this is positive opinions. And you can see that we're looking at there, you know, say 80,000 tweets per month on this. So I'm I'm thinking that this, you know, there's certainly a lot of interest and a lot of money being spent on on this idea. This gives you an indication, and again, this is, these are projections, but this is basically various companies that are involved in this and when they're expected to introduce this and kind of what the extent of the automation is. Um, most of these are kind of geared to more inner city kind of um, driving. You can see, you know, these are not, well, some of these are not high speed um, travel, but there are lots, uh, there's probably not a car company that doesn't have some. in, and again, this comes from the KPMG, where they did they did some survey work and some focus group, and you can't, uh, I'll explain what this is, and they said, if you were going to buy an autonomous vehicle, who would you buy it from? Um, these are tech companies, these are mass market um, car manufacturers, and these would be the high end, like the Mercedes, and so they said, who would you buy it from? And not surprisingly, they said, they could probably buy it from a tech company. So, what are some of the, and I guess this is the, the more interesting bit about, what, what are some of the implications of these advances become reality? And I can tell you that there's probably, you 
just that it would be a great thing. So, what, what autonomous vehicles would do is as the, you know, those accident rates would decline, as the uptake of these autonomous vehicles uh, started to come into the market. And so what would that mean? Well, one would be reduction in police uh, and EMT uh, staffs because Fewer emergency room patients. So besides the 30,000 deaths, there are something on the order of a million and a half uh, hospital uh, admittance injuries from car crashes. The other bit uh, is, well, if these cars weren't going to be crashing as often, can we change the way we think about building cars? So right now, the assumption is the car is going to get in a crash. What can we do to minimize the injury? So, you know, there's, there's we've got cages, roll bars, lots of steel, lots of airbags. If cars weren't going to crash anymore, we can kind of rethink how we manufacture the vehicles. And the view is that the reduction in all this stuff would offset any increased cost because of the technology. Now, those, the Google cars that are out there, I think there's about 40 of them that are in testing, um, they, the technology on those is about uh, $150,000 per car. But again, this is, these are all prototypes, they're not in production. And the folks that kind of know more about the technical stuff said that they think that because of this, less of this stuff, that cars might actually drop in price, not even. insurance claims, so if you have less car accidents, you would have uh, certainly less claims, uh, and you know, we probably need to rethink how these vehicles are insured. Certainly you would less, less need for auto body shops because people wouldn't be uh, getting in crashes as much. So just the accident rate alone, that drop, has lots of potential um, you know, benefits. Maybe not as many if you are a car company or a car insurance company or in the auto body repair business. What about road design and infrastructure? So, um, again, as, I mean, th this thing wouldn't happen overnight. They, you know, there would be a phase in just like any kind of uptake of technology. But as you've got more of these autonomous vehicles, you know, we would have to rethink some things about how we build roads. And just like the car manufacturing process where we try to, you know, anticipate a crash and what can we do to minimize that, a lot of what we do on our roads are done for simple reasons. We have, you know, because humans are imprecise and unpredictable, uh, we need to have extra wide lanes, wide shoulders, rumble strips, guardrails, all those kind of things to make it safe so that when somebody uh, is not paying attention, makes a human error, which 90% of the car crashes are the result of human error, um, we kind of minimize the you know, death and injury rate. So if we had to do less of this stuff, we would basically have less money spent on, on infrastructure at a time which
it's there, but there's certainly some issues that we're not sure how this is going to play out. The view is that if we had fewer cars, what does that mean for car manufacturing? Um, and who's going to be doing the car manufacturing? It could be that, uh, that Google becomes the big car manufacturer, not uh, Ford or General Motors, or that they form some sort of partnership or Google kind of outfits the technology side of things and, and the, the existing car companies don't make it. But the idea that we would need fewer cars, and that there's lots of speculation about how many fewer cars, uh, be it 20%, 40%, Insurance is another issue which we've touched on. Um, if you had a reduction in accidents, those, those rates would, would drop, but it may require some new model for how you insure these things. And one of the ideas is that from a liability standpoint, it would move from insuring the driver to where the onus is on the driver to where the onus is on the, the vehicle manufacturer because it's the technology that's really speculated that this might result in that model about to subscribe to a, uh, some sort of mobility service or some sort of um, you know, car sharing thing where there's fleet ownership to kind of spread this liability risk because I think the, the car companies may not want to take on all the liability risk. And to some extent, you can think about this in terms of the small planes, you know, small plane manufacturers like Cessna and Piper and so forth. space because we could actually have narrower lanes, less uh, you know, medians and all those kind of things. The, the, the road corridors could be smaller. Um, but in terms of what impact this might have on suburban expansion, we don't know. We don't know. Not, I'm not sure anybody's even thought about this question. You know, but if you had potentially cheaper transportation services, uh, people might decide that out on their own acre of land, um, and if transport was not a big deal, and you have a smart vehicle that can avoid all the congestion, then maybe you know we would get more suburban development. But you know there are other trends that I mentioned earlier about you know the younger generation has different views on this, and it may be that this doesn't really have much impact on that. But again, part of most of this presentation was to kind of raise issues about where we might need to start thinking about uh, transport and transportation uh, planning. So with that, I will uh, stop talking and entertain questions and see what, see what people think about whether they think I'm uh, as wacky as I thought some of the engineering guys were that came to me at my university a few years ago saying how these autonomous vehicles are the thing you guys need to get on board. Yes? similar model to the, the taxis. Uh, right now, the reason we have big trucks and heavy trucks that create most of the damage on the roads is because of the cost of the driver. If you remove the cost of the driver and basically scale down the freight to, to small
because there are a lot of people associated with the industry. Yeah. Well, well, that's that's kind of what I think. It's interesting because I was trying. I got the KPMG. I've downloaded the reports, and they're free. You can you can download them. I was curious as to what the motivation was, why they were why they were doing this, and who, who was funding them. But I don't I don't know that. I think some of this is just being done because somebody there thinks that this is something that they need to get a jump on. I think. But in terms of looking at at the economic impacts, probably not. Although they have identified. Some of the, the industries that might want to be thinking cautiously about this, and the car manufacturers would be one, insurance companies would be another, uh, about you know deciding who's going to, how they're going to position themselves. Now, this the first, so the, the KPMG did two reports. The first one was basically looking at, you know, is this really going to happen, and what are the impediments to this? What's called it? It's this is clearly a disruptive.
you have, the greater the capacity increase and the safer for everyone. Well, yeah, I, I didn't. No, it's a good point. And I didn't. Some, some of the things, like, like one of the infrastructure questions is that they said, well, we could remove a lot of traffic signals and stop signs because we wouldn't need them anymore. But, but that, that's the thing. You close your eyes as your automated car. Well, no, but, but remember, there's, there's an issue with legacy vehicles, which they know. I mean, it's a term that these guys have designed. A legacy vehicle is something that it, I, actually has a human driving. But, 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 but the thing of it is, with the auto, if, if you have the automated stuff, it can still deal with the fact that you're, you're having this transition. But if, if there are big efficiency returns to scale, though, you know, say Atlanta or Toronto or Brisbane is the first place to do this, you know, you will gradually build up, but if there are indeed returns to scale, it could end up happening a lot more quickly than we think now because it will be a lot more efficient to have 95% autonomous vehicles than 50% or even 75%. So if some city or a metropolitan area grabs the lead um, and is the first to do this then um, and then demonstrates the feasibility, it actually um, snowball and happen pretty quickly because of the capacity increases and the efficiency well, returns to scale. And so that there are other things like, you know, if basically you're in an autonomous vehicle, you can actually, you can do your social networking, you can work, you can do whatever, you know, it's just like you were on public transport. So there are actually productivity gains as well. Um, okay. But one thing that you mentioned is a little segue to some of the issues that haven't been resolved. And this is, I learned this from listening to this two things that um, that they still are, are working on and haven't resolved. And so one, because there's cameras, both there's radar, there's LIDAR, there's all kinds of things around the car, but there's also cameras inside. The one thing the camera inside has got a problem with is when a bug hits the windshield. <laughs> it does not know how to deal. I mean, they, it's in, you'd say, well, sure, surely they can figure that out. Well, it doesn't know whether that bug is on the 